Who are you? Uh, me? Uh, yes, you. Um, I, I think, don't think, feel. Ah, I feel good. And I also feel, uh, I also, uh, you, you know what? I, I think I'm a rock star! Woo! Yeah! I'm a rock star! Oh, go! Oh, oh, oh no! Uh, oh, but I can adapt, I know. I can adapt. I need to adapt. Uh, what can I do? The good thing is, uh, oh, maybe I have something over here. Let's, yes, I can adapt. I know this is my job. Oh, I'm a musician. Oh, what can I do? I know. The good thing nobody saw this. So, okay. Oh, I have a little bit of this. Oh, let's put this over here. Okay. Now nobody noticed that I transformed this into a drum kit now. Yeah, all right. I feel. I think. I think I'm swimming. I'm swimming in the ocean. I'm swimming in the ocean. I'm swimming in the ocean. I'm swimming in a in an ocean of thoughts. Yeah, I sort of. I'm swimming in an ocean of thoughts. Swimming in an ocean of thoughts. In an ocean of thoughts. Yeah, thoughts. Life is raw. Life is raw, I think. Just raw. Not, uh, life is terrible. Some people say that, I've heard it. Life is terrible. Life, uh, life is mean. Life is mean. I don't think it's mean. I think it's raw. Just raw. So I've heard this, these adjectives and those adjectives to, you know, to talk about life and I just think it's raw. I've heard it, but I've learned it's raw. I used to hear it, now after some years ago, I know it's raw, but I think it's good raw, you know. So because it's raw, I think you all need to learn to cook. Okay, metaphorically. Uh, so, um, we need to actually learn to cook because, uh, cook metaphorically speaking, because we need to spice life. Life is not just about, you know, just walking around and repeating, reproducing things. That's not what I think anyway, and I've learned it the hard way. So, uh, I had an accident, and this is where my story begins. I want to tell you a story, but this is not one of those once upon a time stories. This is one of those stories that goes beyond and has no ending. So, uh, this is the story of the search for my true self. And I've spent quite a lot of time doing that, actually, and I have come to some conclusions and to this certain space in my mind where I'm pretty comfortable emotionally. And it's really nice. Now, let me tell you about it. Uh, my story begins with an accident that was eight years ago. I fell out of a window on the second floor, broke my spine, and as I was lying on the floor, I was thinking, oh, because I, I was a former uh, free rider for, uh, for downhill extreme free riding. And I had been hospitalized before, and really badly. I have many injuries. So I thought, OK, this is a real bad bike crash. But I was paraplegic. So I'm not moving my body. And I'm thinking, OK, this is, this is something different. And I just, by instinct, I took my sanity, or whatever that means, <laughs> I put my sanity, which I thought was my sanity, and I just put it in a little box, 
in the corner of my mind. And I just left it there because, uh, I don't know, by instinct, I felt I was going to need it someday. And, uh, okay, the rough ride went on. A few days later, I was in Santiago, the capital city of Chile. I was uh, in hospital recovering. And I was, uh, you know, feeling real weird things. I was having really bad dreams, nightmares, and then I was having really good uh, dreams, and then waking up to the nightmare, which was, you know, not being able to move in a bed. I was here down, I couldn't move. So I felt really bad because I just couldn't do anything, you know, for myself. Uh, that, was, that was bad. So I, uh, anyway, went to Santiago, and I started uh, full recovery, full recovery, uh, for three months, and I just couldn't take it. Uh, I was doing weights and everything, and I just uh, decided to leave the hospital. They said, you need to be here a year, because you will need a psychologist, and you will go crazy, because you either just go plain crazy, or, you know, you get professionally depressive, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I was just, I don't know, I was thinking, I'm somewhere in between. So, uh, what can I do? Uh, okay, I was, uh, I was good riding bikes, so at least I can take my wheelchair and just go out in the streets and maybe do some, you know, freestyle or something or whatever. So, um, okay, left the, my mom actually helped me to escape because I actually stole a wheelchair from the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> I went back to, to Osorno, which is my parents' uh, home city, and I started a recovery, and I, what I did was, at first, I started designing models for my new existence. It was a different existence now. As I had lived in that house for many years, and I used to run around and, you know, do my, my whole, the whole thing, you know, the wild thing, because I was a pretty wild kid. So um, I started just designing these new models of life, and I thought, okay, I need to recover my life. So, um, okay, I started... Uh, thinking on what can I do, what can I do, and I was, in, I was an English teacher, I was teaching at a private institute. Couldn't go back to it because the institute was actually on a, my, where I taught was on a second floor, and the third floor, and it has, had no build, uh, lifts. So, uh, well, the, I asked for changes, and the job said, no, we actually can't do anything, so I lost my job. So, my parents helped me because my dad had an office at home, so I started sharing the office with my dad. I transformed it into a private classroom and started teaching. How did I do that? Well, put up some ads, newspaper, local supermarkets, and I had my first student. Then for a year, I taught in that classroom with big groups, and it, it all worked out pretty well. And I just uh, thought, OK, it's time to move on. So uh, that year finished, and I told my family, mom and dad, you know, thank you for everything, but I need to go on with my life in a wheelchair now, but whatever. So I moved to Temuco, which is where I am now. Now, um, I had a band, a rock band, because I am professor, but also musician. So in the music thing, I had a rock band, and a pretty good one, you know? We, we went to many shows. We used to play gigs in, in Temuco, and uh, I'm sorry, or in Osorno, local pubs. And we even had a big show in Santiago. And I was uh, the front man, the vocals, the lead vocals. And the, the thing is, they waited for me. So after four months being in Osorno, after the accident, I went back to being the, the lead vocal. And uh, we went to the shows. But now I was on a wheelchair being the front man, you know, and doing the heavy metal stuff, you know, like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> and the people look like, whoa, 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 what's going on, this guy? Is <laughs> What's going on? Is this a show? <laughs> you must be teasing because what's going on? And uh, uh, <laughs> the thing is, uh, we had a project. We were four guys. Three of us were teachers. So we, this, this bug inside us, you know, of research, well, some of us, uh, made us think of a project. And we started going to schools, nine in the morning, this was our project, to see the effects of heavy metal music on kids at nine in the morning, first break. <laughs> So the, the, the weird thing is, uh, we, we did this, and it worked. 
Well, imagine we wore masks and I, we were doing the whole crazy thing and the bell rang, they went out to the yard and we, these crazy guys, you know, like, Whoa. and they were just astonished. They were astonished. They couldn't believe what was going on in the yard. And we asked for reports afterwards for t from teachers and they all said the same thing. They, it had a direct impact on their classrooms after the break. They were all quiet, more friendly, even happy. <laughs> so that was a good thing. Now, um, let me tell you a little bit about being in the hospital, hospital life. And this is about uh, my topic, which is defying Will. Who's Will? Where is he? Where did he go? Will, please come back. I need you, everybody. Yeah, well, where's Will? Well, Will is inside of us. You don't have to look around, it's inside you. The thing is, you have to defy it, because will on its own, it's cozy. It likes to sit around. Okay, so that's why one of the big lessons I learned is that you have to defy your will in order to do things. That was a, like a major epiphany. So, uh, hospital life was weird. I met very nice people, very strange people, bizarre moments, really, really weird stuff, but also very, very dear things, very uh, endearing moments, very, I don't know, it was a strange thing. But it lasted for three months because I had just had to leave there. It was a, pretty much a madhouse full of uh, different people and characters there. Now, uh, one of the things I learned, uh, more than I, oh, actually more than I learned, is um, what I felt. I, something just uh, wasn't right, because my mind, on one side, uh, was telling me that I am the same guy, lying on the bed, not being able to move. But on the other side, I just couldn't move my body. So I'm thinking, okay, um, am I the same person? Who am I? Like Hardy said just before, who am I? Uh, am I this guy on a bed now? Or am I still me? So who's me? Who am I? Basically, right? So you start going really inside and you go places you had never been before because you ask, you know, that method. Uh, yeah, there is a method to look for a true answer, which is to ask like, at least five, five times why. So I was like 15 times, like, why? And why? And why? And why, 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 why? You know, like deep down to the center of the earth. So, okay, um, my, mind was the same. <clears throat> my mind was the same, but my body was different. So as I just thought, okay, there is something has totally changed, which is my body, so I need to do something about it, and that's mentally, in order to keep going. So, what do I need to keep going? Uh, I need to move, what do I need? I need something like a little uh, cartwheel of some kind, with wheels on it, so that I can place this, you know, body on it, and then carry my body around. Okay, that's a nice thought for myself, I thought. And a strange one too, because most people see wheelchairs and think, poor guy, you know, and they incline their heads and, oh, you know. It's and in, in this kind of pity way, like a dead dog on the road, you know. Oh, poor thing. <laughs> you know? I'm no dead dog on the road, you know. So, I thought, as a sort of uh, you know, similitude or a syllogism, I thought, okay, my wheelchair as a transport for my body, as my body as a tra transport for my head when I was walking. So pretty much it's still me. It's just this head just going around. So, okay, I can't carry it like this around, but I can use the wheelchair to move around. So, it's still me. That was great comfort, believe me. That was great comfort. I felt I was me. So um, I started going around and meeting people. Now, this was bizarre because uh, some people just can't take the wheelchair and they're like, oh, oh yeah, oh, poor you. And then other guys are like, you know, doing the whole uh, screening filter thing and they're like, oh yeah, man, cool. Ooh, 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 ooh. And they just, you know, still just leave. But some people just really, uh, you know, try to feel you yeah, in a good way. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> that went out wrong anyway. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, you know, this, I have this in my mind. Uh, I just want to give an example of crazy people. I was once just not walking, rolling, you know, rolling, rolling, you know, I was going through a city square and this woman came up to me and she, she was looking at me, she was like, you know, like airplanes when they're firing, like push, lock and engage position and like, she's coming straight at me with lock, push, engaging thing, whatever, oh my God, what does this woman want? And she's coming like walking really fast, I've never seen, in my, seen her in my life, I'm full of papers and I was, Starting up a business, actually, I was teaching or at an institute. I, have, I had found a job here in Temuco, and I was doing my life really well. And it's all here. And this woman comes up to me, and she throws herself at me. She li she, she listens to me, and she's like, "How oh, poor you are!" <laughs> and I'm like, with this woman on me, city square, I've never seen her. It's like she's hugging me really like tightly, and crying and saying that I'm like, "Oh, poor you." That's when I understood that uh, there are limits to being nice. <laughs> Both ways. She was, she, <laughs> because I'm not going to tell you what I did, but <laughs> I tried to get lost a little bit. Um, so um, I just want to leave you with a, with a thought. Um, we live, we have many oceans around the world, lots of water, and we are water. It resembles a sort of a, a big part of us, and uh, big oceans, we can stand sometimes and look at the oceans and see how you know, vast it is and beautiful stuff. And then I can uh, look up the sky whenever I feel I can open my mind and try to you know, reach as far as I can with the eyes. Not a telescope, just my eyesight. Go deep, infinity, infinity. I can also go inside. There's a big ocean inside of us, huge ocean. So my thought for you is, um, after all, we are, and this is Carl Sagan, by the way. He says, we're all standing on the shore of the cosmic ocean. So I wish you all a happy life, and thank you for sharing emotions. <laughs>